So in today's video, I'm going to show you my complete on-page SEO checklist. This is the exact step-by-step -step checklist we use for every SEO campaign we work on. In fact, we just use this exact checklist to grow pages organic search traffic by 1,337%. And then we used it again to grow this page's traffic by 1,059%. Now, here's my promise to you when you watch this entire training video. You will never need to read, watch, or consume any other content about on-page SEO after you watch. Now, does that sound good? Well, before we get started, like this video right now to show me you're pumped and leave a comment below saying, let's do this to show me you're excited. Let's get started. Hey, so welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Nathan Gotch and I'm the founder of Gotch SEO. And in this video, I'm going to walk you through my agency's entire on-page SEO checklist from A to Z. Now, if you're not subscribed to my channel, please subscribe because I publish in-depth SEO and digital marketing videos that will help you grow any company you're working for or working on. And don't forget to hit the bell button because you'll get first access to new training when you do it. So the first thing we need to tackle is what is on-page SEO? On-page SEO is the process of optimizing a single page on your website. This is not to be confused with on-site SEO, which is the process of optimizing an entire website. However, these two types of optimization are not mutually exclusive. For example, an on-site optimization action like installing an SSL certificate is also a good on-page optimization action. It's also important to mention the difference between on-page SEO versus off-page SEO. Off-page SEO is nothing more than another way to say link building. Link building or off-page SEO is the process of acquiring backlinks to your website. So while on-page SEO is the foundation you need to rank, you'll usually need a substantial off-site SEO plan to acquire backlinks to your pages and website as a whole. It's definitely possible to rank without many backlinks, but in most cases, you'll need them. Now, the next question is, why is on-page SEO important? Most people with basic knowledge of SEO usually equate on-page SEO with just placing keywords on a page. And there's no denying that keywords are critical for on-page optimization, but there's much more to the process. As you'll soon find out, on-page optimization includes keywords, copywriting, media, links, user experience, and even conversions. Understanding and executing all of these on-page SEO factors is important because it will determine how well your page will rank in Google. What I'll be showing you isn't just about rankings though. This checklist will help you optimize your pages to the fullest extent, but it will also help you increase dwell time, build rapport for your brand, and even drive conversions. So now it's time to show you how to do on-page SEO step-by-step. -step. Just follow this checklist and you'll achieve a perfectly optimized page. So the first part of this process is performance. So number one, do you have Google Analytics tracking set up? You need a way to measure the SEO performance of your page. And Google Analytics is pretty hard to beat, but there are some decent alternatives out there like Clicky. Just make sure you have a way to track organic search traffic and conversions. Number two, are you tracking your primary keyword phrase? Tracking individual keywords isn't as straightforward as it used to be because of localization, personalization, and other factors. However, you should still be tracking your primary keyword just to make sure you're on the right track. I personally use Ahrefs to track keyword performance. So now let's move on to phase two, which is crawling and indexing. So number three, is your page crawlable? You simply can't rank if Google spiders can't access your page. Your robots.txt file and no index tags are two common culprits you need to look out for. This tool is perfect for checking your page's crawlability. Just enter your URL and click submit. Then the tool will show you everything that is or isn't blocking search engine crawlers. You want to see a 200 status code. And no news is good news when it comes to the other sections. You can also use Screaming Frog SEO Spider to make sure your pages are crawler accessible. Just click the response codes tab and select blocked by robots.txt. So number four, is your page indexable? Having a crawlable page is the first step to ranking in Google. The second step is to make sure that your page actually gets indexed. So the best way to check if your page is properly indexed is to copy your URL and paste it into Google. Established pages should show up. And if they don't, then you need to take some additional steps. First, 
check if the page is using the no index tag. Just click the directives tab in Screaming Frog and select no index from the filter dropdown. If it passes that test, then you need to examine your site architecture. Sometimes your page is buried too deep within your website and crawlers aren't able to reach it. This issue is most common with e-commerce websites or really large websites. So to find out, click the site architecture tab in Screaming Frog and look under the crawl depth section. You want most of your pages to be no more than three clicks deep. And if your page passes both of these tests, then you should use the fetch as Google tool. Now, the last way to get your page indexed is to simply acquire backlinks to it. So now that you're tracking performance, your page is crawlable and your page is indexed, it's time to optimize your page for your primary keyword. Which brings me to point number five, are you targeting the right keywords? Some people overestimate their ability to rank for certain keywords. You need to go through extensive keyword qualification and competitor analysis processes to ensure that you're targeting the right keywords. I won't go too deep into it here, but here's a 30,000 foot keyword qualification process you can use. First, run your keyword through Ahrefs Keyword Explorer tool, and you can quickly eliminate keywords based on keyword difficulty or KD. For example, newer websites or websites that lack authority shouldn't target keywords greater than a KD of 50. If your keyword passes the KD test, then you need to compare your website against the ranking competitor competitors on average. Gather the following data points for each competitor and average them out. DR, backlinks, total linking root domains, which you can export from Ahrefs Keyword Explorer, and word count. So now you have a roadmap of what you'll need to do to compete for your target keyword phrase. So number six is have you already targeted this keyword? So keyword cannibalization, which is when multiple pages target the same primary keyword phrase, is something you need to keep tabs on. Here's an example. So avoiding this issue at the onset should be a priority for every SEO campaign. Trust me when I say this, it's a nightmare working through large scale keyword cannibalization issues. So here's what you need to know. Target one primary keyword per page and then focus on creating and updating that one page. Don't create or optimize another page for the same primary keyword. Now I should mention the hub and spoke model. You can target closely related keywords if the intent is different. For example, on Gotcha SEO, I have a blog post about how to do an SEO audit, which is informational intent, and then I have a page targeting SEO audit service, which is transactional intent. These keyword phrases are closely related, but have much different intent. So here's a visual from Jimmy Daly. Just make sure you don't get this model twisted and think that you should start pumping out thin pages around your primary page slash keyword. Which brings me to point number seven, which is does your page satisfy search intent? So if you've been following my work or you're a member of Gotcha SEO Academy, then I know you're probably sick of me talking about this. But the truth is it's so incredibly important and it's something that a lot of websites get wrong. So there are four primary categories of search intent. Number one is informational, which would be how to get backlinks. Number two are transactional, which are buy backlinks. Number three are comparison queries, which are mods versus hrefs. And number four are navigational queries like gotch SEO. So understanding the intent behind your target keyword should dictate how you structure your page. For example, if you're targeting a keyword phrase that has informational intent, then that page should educate and attempt to to build rapport. The truth is most searchers are not ready to buy when searching informational keywords. They're likely at the beginning of the customer journey and you need to be cognizant of that and structure your page as an educational resource. Now that doesn't mean you shouldn't try to push the prospect to the next stage in the buying cycle, but you need to take baby steps. Now lead magnets are my go-to CTA for searchers at this stage. So number eight, is your primary keyword in the title? Now while SEOs don't agree on everything, most would have a hard hard time disputing that your primary keyword should be in your pages title tag. So if you do anything on this checklist, make sure your target keyword is in your title. But if on-page SEO was as simple as placing your keyword in the title, then there would be a lot more successful SEOs. But here's the truth, that's a bare minimum on-page SEO action. So to take your title tag optimization up another notch, you need to improve its clickability. Which brings me to point number nine, which is, is your title click worthy? Google uses the words in your title tag to understand what your page is about. But there's another side of title tags that you need to understand. First, you can find your website's SERP CTR performance in Google's Search Console when you click on Performance. And it's critical that you make your title as eye-catching and click-worthy as possible. In fact, increasing your search 
SERP CTR is one of the easiest ways to get more organic search traffic without creating any new content. Which brings me to point number 10, which is can you add modifiers to your title? So title modifiers like best, top, or the year, 2019 for example, can help you capture more long tail organic search traffic. Now number 11 is have you used all of your title tag real estate? Titles can be as long as 65 characters before being truncated in Google SERPs. You should take full advantage of this character real estate. Just make sure your keyword is toward the front of the title, but after that, you should use all the copywriting techniques you can to entice searchers to click on your result. You can use Screaming Frog to find all titles under or over 65 characters when you click on page titles and click the filter dropdown. So number 12 is, is your page title wrapped in an H1 tag? Every page on your website should have an H1 tag, and you can use Screaming Frog SEO Spider to find what pages don't currently have H1s. Just click the H1 tab and select missing H1s from the filter dropdown. Now the question is, can you have more multiple H1s on a page, and how does that impact SEO performance? Regardless of whether you use HTML5 or not, having multiple H1 elements on a page is fine. The answer is yes, but it would be a very rare circumstance when I would even consider doing it. Number 13, is your primary keyword in the meta description? Now Google often rewrites meta descriptions, but it's still a good idea to write a descriptive one that includes your primary keyword. For example, Google replaced my meta description for my guide about 301 redirects with the first couple sentences of my content. Number 14, is your meta description click worthy? So like your title, you you should try to make your meta description as click worthy as possible. Number 15, is your primary keyword in your URL? In my experience, pages that have the primary keyword in the URL tend to perform better. Google also claims that having your keyword in the URL is a very small ranking factor. Number 16, is your URL structure lean? There's some evidence that shorter URLs perform better, but it's likely a very small factor. The main reason for shortening your URLs is for UX, and that's because long URLs are hard to remember and even difficult to share. So with that said, there really are no benefits of having long URLs. So cut all the fat off your URLs and leave only your target keyword phrases. Number 17, is your primary keyword in the first sentence? Now it's extremely challenging to test micro on-page SEO factors such as placing your keyword phrase in the first sentence, but it's something I've always personally done. To me, if you want Google's algorithm to truly understand what your page is about, then you need to make it abundantly clear. So naturally, place Placing your target keyword phrase in the first sentence is a perfect way to achieve that goal. Number 18, is your keyword density too aggressive relative to your competitors? Many argue that you shouldn't pay attention to keyword density, and I agree for the most part. You should write your content in the most natural way possible, and the density should work its way out. However, it doesn't hurt to check the competition to identify the average keyword density for your target keyword phrase. Just use this tool to gather the keyword density for each competitor and then average it out. Then just just compare your current density to that average. If you're creating an entirely new page, then create the content first and then adjust. Just keep in mind, keyword placement is more important than density. Number 19, have you added variations of your primary keyword into the copy? So it's smart to structure your pages around one primary keyword. However, you should also try to rank that page for all the closely related variations as well. One of my favorite ways to find these keyword variations is to use Ahrefs Keyword Explorer. Just enter your primary keyword phrase and then click on also rank for. Number 20, have you added synonyms of your primary keyword into the copy? Google's Hummingbird algorithm is designed to rank pages based on themes, not just keywords. Now, while it's important to structure your page around your primary keyword, you also need to interweave other relevant synonyms and topics around it. If you examine my backlinks guide, you'll see this in action. Every single section on that page was deliberate. All I did was pull all the ideas from answer the public and other keyword tools and put them on the page. So in short, your page should be answering every question and solving every problem around your target keyword phrase. Just be careful not to intermingle different intents. For example, that's why I created a separate page for the keyword phrase by backlinks instead of just placing that section in my guide. My backlinks guide has informational intent while by backlinks has transactional intent. So now let's move on to phase four, which is content. So 21, is your page different and better 
better than your competitors. Unique is better than long. Every page on your website that you wanna rank needs to bring something new and fresh to the table. Always approach your content from the angle of how are we going to make this page different than what currently exists while adding more value. Now this is much easier when you're competing for informational queries, but how do you make your page unique when you're competing for transactional queries like Los Angeles criminal lawyer? Well, first you need to leverage the content that is unique to your brand. And that's going to be testimonials, case studies, and results. That should be the focal point of every effective local page because you're trying to persuade searchers to become a lead. And you achieve that goal by having overwhelming social proof and establishing your brand's authority. Second, your page's UX and UI needs to be better than your competitors. Now, fortunately, on the local level, most businesses aren't willing to invest in design. That means there's a strategic advantage if you do. The other big factor that most local businesses ignore is UX. Pages targeting transactional queries should be built for conversions or goal completions. That means forms should be above the fold and CTAs should be prominent. Thirdly, most local businesses aren't willing to invest time or money into video production, graphic design, or quality photography. You should invest in multimedia if you're serious about ranking. I've personally invested over $30,000 in video editing alone. It's worth it. And my last recommendation is to educate. Can you add an FAQ to the page that makes a searcher more likely to become a lead? Can you give them accurate, unbiased educational information that will help them make an informed decision? Helping searchers and adding value builds goodwill, which builds trust for your brand. And trust is the key to high conversions. 22, is your copy free of spelling and grammatical errors? Use tools like Grammarly to find spelling and grammatical errors. And the truth is Google isn't fond of spelling and grammatical errors based on what they said in their search quality evaluator guidelines. It also wouldn't hurt to hire a proofreader or editor to go through your pages. 23, is your copy longer on average than your competitors? Now there's some correlation that pages with more words tend to perform better in Google. It's just really important not to take this out of context. Your copy needs to be well-crafted and thought out. Writing several thousand words of fluff content won't do much. As I mentioned in the previous checkpoint, your copy needs to be radically different different than your competitors, not just longer. Use this tool or Screaming Frog to see how long your competitor's content is. 24, is your copy well-written? So some SEOs forget that not all writing is created equally. Just because you wrote 2,000 words doesn't mean it's good. Writing is a skill and some people are further along than others. You really only have two options. Spend thousands of hours writing and reading to improve your ability or hire someone who already has the skill. If you aren't a great writer but don't have the budget to hire, then write the content and have an editor go through to improve it. 25, is your copy scannable? Internet users scan before they read. That's why your content needs to use all the methods available to improve the scannability of your page. This is super important for text heavy pages like blog posts or articles. You need to use your best judgment to give this check a pass or fail, but here's a simple two-step process. First, scan your target page that you wanna optimize. Then assess whether or not a reader can get an understanding of what the page is about without reading the entire thing. 26, is your copy written for an eighth grader? There are target markets that warrant advanced writing and content, but they are the minority. Your content should be written to be understood and actionable. If someone can't understand what you're talking about and how to implement what you're suggesting, then there's a problem. Some experts forget that no one cares how much you know or how much experience you have. It's believed that we as humans are inherently self-interested. We want to know how you're going to help us. That's why crafting your content so that it reads at an eighth grade level or below is so effective. It makes your content easier to understand, easier to take action on, and makes you far more relatable. You can use Hemingway Writer to make your content easier to understand. More importantly, study the best direct response copywriters of all time like David Ogilvy, Dan Kennedy, and Frank Kern, and you'll see that simple writing wins. Number 27, is your copy engaging? Writing at an eighth grade level or lower is the first step to writing engaging copy. The second step is to actually be engaging when you write. People need to consume your content before they take action. That's why all of these tactics in this copywriting section are so important. From an SEO perspective, if searchers are engaging and digesting your content, that is a positive signal for your page. It will increase dwell time, and if you've done a good job, the searcher may complete another action, such as sharing your page, visiting another page, subscribing to your list, becoming a lead, 
need, or even purchasing one of your products. So now the question is, how do you make your copy more engaging? Well, first, write to one reader by using pronouns such as you and yours. Second, interweave relevant stories to illustrate points. Lastly, actually know what you're talking about. While it's easy to fake expertise online, most readers sniff out BS. Number 28, does your copy use short paragraphs? Long paragraphs are like the kryptonite for internet users. Massive blocks of text are one of the most repelling things you'll encounter online. Keep your paragraphs short and scannable. I personally wouldn't go beyond three sentences per paragraph. And I know this isn't what your English teacher taught you, but they've likely never sold anything on the internet. Number 29, are your headings structured logically? Using logical page structure won't have a profound effect on your performance, but it's still a good practice. Every page should have an H1 tag, and then you should follow it with an H2, H3, H4, etc. Number 30, is your copy using descriptive headings? I learned the concept of descriptive headings from Frank Kern. In short, a reader should be able to scan your headings and understand exactly what the content is about. Kern refers to this as headings that tell a story. He also mentions that readers almost always scan content before they commit to reading the entire thing. That's why descriptive headings are so important. Number 31, have you used keyword variations, LSI keywords, or synonyms in your headings? Your H1 tag can be similar to your title tag, but other headings should include variations of your primary keyword, LSIs, and synonyms. Answer the public is perfect for finding these keyword variations. Number 32, is your copy using bullet points and numbered lists? Use bullet points and numbered lists as frequently as you can. This will break up your content and make it easier for readers to commit to digesting it. Number 33, is your copy fresh? You should review your copy at least biannually or annually to make sure it's still accurate. Keeping your content accurate and current is critical for pleasing Google's algorithms. And this concept is mentioned countless times in Google's search engine evaluator guidelines. There's also a better ROI when you improve existing assets as opposed to creating new assets. So let's move on to phase five, which is image optimization. So 34, does your page have as many or more images than your competitors? Unique images make your page more interesting and engaging, and you should aim to have at least as many unique images as your competitors or more. 35, are your images unique to your website? Like writing, not all images are created equally. Always strive to have unique images and graphics on your page. Now, of course, this may require hiring a graphic designer or a photographer, but it's a worthwhile investment because it will improve the quality and appeal of your page. Plus, it'll improve your brand's perception if you put in that extra little effort. 36, are your images high quality? Getting unique images is the first step. The second step is making sure that they're actually good. Hire a professional to take pictures or create graphics. Businesses love to cut corners to save money, but in the long run, it doesn't actually save you money because low quality pictures and graphics hurt your brand's perception. Number 37, are you using the right image format? Deciding between PNG, JPEG, or GIFs doesn't have a massive impact on SEO performance, but it can help with page loading speed. PNG is the highest quality out of the three, and that means it will likely take the longest to fully load. At the end of the day, don't worry, it's not a life or death decision. Default to PNG and JPEG because they're the most common. Number 38, are your image sized appropriately? Your image should be sized and uploaded as the size they're going to appear on your page. This prevents image downsizing, which will improve your page's loading speed. 39, are your images compressed? Using high quality images is super important, but you also need to make sure that they're optimized for loading speed. Images are often one of the biggest culprits of slow loading pages. And the way to prevent this is to compress your images. Tools like Optimizilla are perfect because it will show you the image compression side by side. That way you don't jeopardize images quality, but you're also optimizing for loading speed. Number 40, do your images have descriptive file names? Google recommends using descriptive file names for your images, but what does that mean? It means you should save your images based on the contents of the image. For example, if your picture is of a 12-week-old male Great Pyrenees, then your file name should be 12-week male Great Pyrenees. This will help with your image search performance. Just don't go overboard and keyword stuff your files. Number 41, do all of your images have descriptive descriptive and accurate alt tag descriptions. Google spiders use alt tags to understand what an image is about. And you should always use descriptive alt tags for every image on your page. So now let's move on to phase six, which is video optimization. So number 42, 
42 is, does your page have video content? Video is one of the preferred mediums of content consumption online. And it's also one of the best ways to engage searchers and keep them on your page for longer, which is a positive user signal. I highly, highly recommend investing in video, even if your competitors aren't. Number 43, are the videos relevant to the page slash primary keyword? So like your images and copy, the video needs to be hyper relevant to the page's content. Number 44, are the videos unique to your brand? Yes, you can go to YouTube and embed any video on your page, but that isn't the best long-term strategy. You should be creating your own unique videos because it's a great way to improve your brand's perception. And it's also another way to grow your brand's presence on the second biggest search engine, which is YouTube. Number 45, are the videos high quality and valuable? Video content is incredibly effective on many different fronts when it's high quality and valuable. Your aim should be to create the best video content you can. But there's a challenge. You need to be decently engaging and articulate when the camera turns on. And this takes time and a ton of patience. So either you need to put in the hours to become engaging or you need a team member who can represent your brand on video. I won't get too deep into creating video because it's outside the scope of this video, but one huge recommendation I have is to script out your content. Number 46, is the video content responsive? Your video should be easily viewable on all devices. YouTube, Vimeo, and Wistia videos are designed to be responsive, but sometimes custom-built websites can cause problems. Use this tool to test your video responsiveness. If your video isn't responsive, you'll need to optimize your design. In the meantime, you can use this tool to make the videos responsive. Number 47, are the videos hosted on the right platform? So deciding where to host your videos is important, both from an SEO and business perspective. From an SEO perspective, YouTube is king because it's the biggest video search engine by far. That's why hosting your videos on YouTube and then embedding them on your keyword targeted page can have a dual effect, meaning you can rank in both Google and YouTube to drive maximum visibility. But if you have no interest in building a YouTube channel, then you can host your videos anywhere and still get all the benefits. Number 48, are the videos optimized? Your video's title should match the keyword your page is targeting. For example, my anchor text guide features a video about anchor text. So now let's move on to phase seven, which are links. Number 49, does your page have internal links? Internal links are a powerful way to build your site's authority, improve your site's crawlability and indexability, and help you rank other important pages on your site. Number 50, are your internal links using descriptive anchor text? Unlike external links, your internal links should use keyword-rich anchor text. Now, one thing I love to do is run my competitors through Screaming Frog SEO Spider to get an idea of their internal link anchor profile. Number 51, are your internal links optimized based on the first link priority? The big factor you need to keep in mind is first link priority, and this means that Google's algorithm likely only counts the first link slash anchor text on a page. And that's the main reason why I typically avoid placing pages I'm trying to rank in the navigation. Number 52, does the page have breadcrumbs? Breadcrumbs are useful for large or e-commerce websites. You just need to keep in mind the first link priority principle, especially if you're trying to rank your category pages. Number 53, are your internal links useful? Injecting internal links for the sole purpose of ranking isn't a great idea. Remember that the goal of your page is to please the user. Every internal link should serve a purpose or help the user in some way. In general, as long as you're linking to relevant and valuable pages, then you'll be good to go. Number 54, are all of your internal links using preferred URLs? Moving to new domains, changing URLs, or installing SSL certificates can cause URLs to change. And the end result is a redirect chain. Redirect chains force link equity to pass through a buffer and may actually slow your page's speed if there are excessive redirects. You should audit your internal links to make sure they're using your preferred URLs. Number 55, does your page have have external links. Linking out to relevant and trusted resources builds the trust of your page. 56, are all affiliate sponsored or paid links using a nofollow tag? Google states in its webmaster guidelines that all paid links should have the nofollow tag. A nofollow tag is supposed to prevent page rank from flowing through the link. Number 57, are all of your external links set to open in a new window? Your goal should be to keep users on your site as long as possible. And that's why you should make sure all external links open in a new window. I know 
this is a super minor issue, but you wouldn't believe how often I find it in audits. Number 58, does your page have broken links? Broken links hurt user experience and need to be tackled on a frequent basis. You should audit your page and site every quarter to identify and fix broken links. Screaming Frog SEO Spider is my favorite tool for accomplishing this goal. Just click the response codes and then click the filter dropdown and select client 4XX and select in links and click in links to find all your broken links. Number 59, are all of your links clearly links? So sometimes web design and UX can clash and deciding how to style links is often one of those challenges. Now I'm in the camp that links should always be underlined and should be a different color than the body text. Links are meant to be clicked on. So now it's time for phase eight, which is user experience optimization. So number 60 is does your page load in less than three seconds? Page speed is one of the most important UX factors. Not only can improving your page's loading speed help SEO performance, but it's also a good business initiative. I recommend both Pingdom and GT metrics to optimize your website loading speed. Number 61, is your page responsive and mobile friendly? The majority of all web searches will be conducted on mobile devices in the near future. That's why there's no debate that your website needs to be mobile friendly. Test your page using this tool to make sure the experience is optimal on all devices. Number 62, does your website have an SSL certificate installed? Google stated a few years ago that SSL certificates would be a part of their algorithm and would also be a ranking factor. Also, Google Chrome now labels websites with the dreaded not secure label. This is a big deterrent for users and having this label could hurt both your search engine performance and even your business. You can use this tool to test your page's security and SSL certificate installation. Number 63, is your font type legible and easy to read on all devices? Now this is a given, but your font type should be easy to read. Some of the easiest fonts to read are Open Sans, Montserrat, and Playfair Display. Number 64, is your font size large enough to be easily read on all devices? Having large readable font is super important on mobile and users shouldn't have to pinch to zoom to read your text. Number 65, does your page use aggressive interstitials? Google has stated that their algorithm will demote pages with aggressive interstitial pop-ups. And honestly, I don't blame them because they're pretty annoying. So if you're going to use them, then only load them when a user visits a second or third page on your website. I would avoid loading them on mobile altogether though, unless it's a slide down or slide up that can be easily closed. Number 66, does your page have aggressive ad placements? One element that Google's original Panda algorithm targeted was aggressive ad placements coupled with thin content. Now some businesses' livelihood depends on ad revenue, but some take it a little too far. If you wanna continue performing well in Google, then you need to think about the user first. So the question is, does jamming ads in their face help them achieve a goal or solve a problem that they were searching for? Every SEO-driven page should be built to serve the user first. Get that part squared away and then think about how to place ads in a way that doesn't disrupt the user's experience. So now for phase nine, which is local, and you really only need to tackle one question for on-page SEO, and that's number 67, is your address prominently displayed? So if you're trying to rank your page in the local pack, then your address needs to be displayed. It doesn't need to be above the fold, but it should at least be in the body of the content or in the footer. Just be careful with placing the address in the footer if you have multiple locations. And that's because most footer will display site-wide, which means your address will be displayed on every page. Now, this isn't an issue if you have one location. However, if you have multiple locations, then you should only display the address on the location page that's most relevant. So the next phase is structured data. Number 68, is your address using structured data? Google claims that structured data isn't a part of their algorithm, and whether that's true is tough to say, but I believe implementing structured data correctly can only have a positive impact on your page's performance. So at the very minimum, wrap your address with structured data to help Google's algorithm better understand your page and your business. Number 69, is your page using structured data? Local businesses will likely benefit from using structured data, but it has so many other uses as well. The good news is that many content management systems have structured data built in and it will do basic markup for you. This schema plugin works perfectly for WordPress. Number 70, is the structured data set up correctly? You want to make sure your structured data 
data is set up correctly once you've implemented it. And the best tool to use is Google's structured data testing tool. The next phase of this process is optimizing your page for your money, your life, and eat. So number 71, are you giving health, financial, or legal advice? Many believe Google's algorithm update on August 1st, 2018, which is called the Medic Update, targeted your money, your life, or YMYL types of websites and pages. In short, any websites offering health, financial, or legal advice will be under greater scrutiny going forward. And the main reason is because incorrect, unproven, or inaccurate information in these spaces can actually hurt a person. Google only wants to rank pages that have accurate information in their search engine. And this is incredibly apparent based on how they score pages in their search engine raters guidelines. So with that said, make sure your page's content is accurate no matter what niche you're in. Number 72, does your page have the appropriate disclaimers? All health, financial, and legal advice should be accompanied by appropriate disclaimers. This not only protects your business, but it's also a signal of trust for your page. Number 73, does your page list and link to all sources of information? Plagiarism can get you kicked out of college. However, on the internet, anyone can steal, copy, and distribute your content and ideas. Now, sure, it definitely sucks, but you don't need to be the scum of the internet. Instead, when you get information from another page that you didn't previously have knowledge of, you should link to that page. First, it's ethical and a common courtesy to do so. And lastly, it makes your page far more trustworthy, both for users and search engines. Number 74, does your blog content have a visible author? Every informational page like blog posts should have a visible author. Now back in the day, hiding your identity was a common practice, but these days it will probably hurt more than help when it comes to your SEO performance. So number 75, is the author credible and qualified to write about the topic? EAT, also known as EAT, which stands for expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness has been a big topic since the August 1st Google update. Some debate whether it's a ranking factor or not, and debating is fun and usually a waste of time, but I don't think it matters either way. A qualified person should be writing your content, and this policy can only benefit your business and SEO performance. Think about it. What page is more valuable? Page A, which is written by someone who has years of experience in X industry, or page B, which was written by some jack of all trades writer you hired on Upwork. It makes logical sense that Google is going to value content written by someone who has the qualifications to write about whatever topic it is. Number 76, does every blog post have a detailed author box and bio? I believe every blog post should have an author box or something similar in a detailed bio of the author. The bio should explain why the author is qualified to write about the topic. Number 77, does each author have a dedicated and detailed author page? Now, this isn't entirely necessary, but I think it's worth the effort. It just adds another level of trust to your content. Now, the author bio at the bottom of each post is just a short description of your writer's qualifications, but the author page is a more detailed description along with links to social media profiles and other articles. So the second to last phase you need to tackle are goal completions, which brings me to point number 78, which is does the page have clear calls to action or CTAs? Some believe that Google puts weight onto goal completions completions. And a goal completion is the action that a user is supposed to take on your page. Now, this will largely depend on the intent of the target keyword phrase. For example, if your page ranks for St. Louis personal injury lawyer, two appropriate goal completions would be contact form submissions and phone calls. Now, it's probably very hard for Google to get this data, but it's still a good business objective. I believe that every page on your website should have a call to action. And as I mentioned, your CTA will depend on the intent of the target keyword. Word. If it's a product page, then your CTA will be sales driven. If it's a top of the funnel informational asset, then your CTA may be as something as simple as asking the user to share your page or leave a comment. Number 79, is the page shareable? Social media sharing buttons should be prominently displayed on informational content because it's more likely to be shared if it's good. Make it as easy as possible for the user to share your content. I personally use Sumumi for most of my websites, but there are many good options out there. And finally, the last on-page SEO phase is optimizing your design and user interface. And you only need to ask one question, which is number 80, is the website design modern and updated? Some websites need serious facelifts, and it's a good investment to continually upgrade your site's design to keep it modern. Striking a balance between design and UX is critical from an SEO perspective, so take it seriously. So wow, that was super intense, but I didn't want to leave any stone left unturned. So if you got value,
value from this training video, please leave a comment below saying awesome. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell button because you'll get first access to new videos like this in the future. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.